Well, thank you all four speakers. That was a fantastic session. I couldn't imagine a better start to the proceedings. Uh, so we have a couple of, uh, of microphones that you can see in the, the stairs. So I would just ask uh, if, you, uh, if you have questions, um, maybe you could uh, start to make your way to one of those two microphones uh, so you can ask. So this is just so that everything can be recorded. Um, and then everyone can just ask questions in turn uh, of any of the, the four speakers. So does anyone, uh, anyone, uh, yes, we have a brave, thank you, Liz. Um, we have, I should say, we have, we're running a little bit behind, but we have, a, we have 10 minutes for, for, for Q&A. Excellent. Uh, this question is for Naomi. I'm curious how the uh, literature on leadership and organizational behavior resonates with your findings. That is, there's transformational leadership, there's transactional leadership. How is that related to your leading from the front, middle, and behind? Well, honestly, we're just, we just, I mean, those are sort of hot off the press, so I haven't even started to begin. And one of the reasons I'm here is to try to learn from uh, those of you who are in that field. So hopefully I'll get some feedback from you. And this, this whole, I mean, literally last couple of weeks we were discovering this idea of leading from the front. I mean, I know about it from the animal literature, but you know, I've, I've talked with people who've told me that there's a lot of um, literature out there, so I'm very excited. Great. To learn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, all the great talks. So my question is kind of the, uh, applicable to everyone who presents today. So many of the cases when uh, we have a collective intelligence, we assume that each individual at least have some small understanding about what's the correct, what's the wrong answers. But in general, the, when we actually work in the real world, we don't even have any clue about what's right, what's wrong. So I was wondering if there's any literature about the animal behavior when they have absolutely no clue about anything about the problem. I mean, um, I, I think like for the ants, for something like um, nest site selection or foraging selection, the idea anyway is that every ant has some kind of internal standard that says what's you know when it's looking at an option, what's um, how good is it relative to some internal um, um, standard that is that might be a, a, a product of learning and and to some degree something that's inherited. Um, so in, in that sense, they, I, I think of them generally as having some kind of um, knowledge of that. On the other hand, in another sense, they don't really know. Um, what, the key thing that they don't know is when they're looking at an option, how does it compare to what else is out there? So the typical situation for an ant colony or for an individual ant within a colony is that it, it, it lacks that knowledge completely. I mean, there are exceptions, but in general, the assumption is, and I think it's often true, is that they're making these they're, although the colony is making a comparison, the individual is not. Um, but I think, that at least for, um, for social insects, in, in the, the cases I'm familiar with, that only really works if there's some internal shared uh, notion of, of, of what the quality is according to some common standard. But that's actually rather poorly studied, the existence of such a standard. It's more of an assumption than, a, than something that we really know to be true. I was thinking that maybe another example would be like the termite mound where you might think that individuals have an assessment locally of yes, the structure looks correct, but actually maybe don't have a global assessment. I mean, the assumption is that unlike my robots, they don't have a map of the perfect mound and the mound could be built around a tree, it could be. So actually how they get it right when there isn't a map for that is and I think it's just really hard to study. You know, same thing would be true for cells, right? The cell in one side of the structure can probably locally assess that that leg is correct, but you know, what was supposed to happen on the other side of the structure? So I don't, I don't know. Maybe those are cases where yeah. the difference between the assessment yeah. and the big picture is really very desperate. Well, that's true with architecture. I mean, I think uh, it would be strange to assume that any termite has a clue what a, what a, what a complete nest looks like. You know, that's, yeah. and, and you might know what a, a bee might know what a good flower is. But I doubt that any termite has the faintest idea what a good nest looks like. Yeah. <laughs> I also think for some decisions of animals, I think in bird flocks it's sometimes very obvious, what the right thing to do is might depend on how many there are of you around mm. and what information the others have. And so in bird flocks there's this information center hypothesis and you often see birds really milling around for long time periods, mm. interacting, and before they, for instance, sit down or take off. And 
people are beginning to think that this actually serves the purpose of finding out what information is around, how many are there, sort of. And you, you first of all need to sense sort of what is available, and then you can make a decision. Can I just ask that, that you identify yourself uh, before you ask a question? Hey, okay, my name is Matt Grobus. I'm a PhD student at Princeton, and um, this question's for Stephen Pratt. Um, so I was thinking um, with uh, Gens's talk with the robofish trying to lead the school away to like a, a, a incorrect decision. And this is something that you guys just touched uh, touched upon. But how hard it would be to get the um, an individual um, ant to go to the the wrong nest choice, and whether there's like say you know one individual takes it into the wrong place, does it ever like reevaluate the decision and then try to lead others to the correct place? Or is there some threshold for when it just completely abandons its personal information? It's just completely relying on others? Or um, if you've given that any thought. Well, there's, I think there's, I showed those two phases of decision making, the sort of tandem run phase and the transport phase. In the tandem run phase, I think that the, the individual's answer are, are still highly independent. So just because an ant is led to a site doesn't mean she's going to herself start recruiting to it. If it's a poor site, then she has a rather low likelihood of starting to recruit to it. You know, still there's some probability there. So, so an error, a, a kind of um, uh, leading to a poor source could conceivably lead to you know, a pretty bad outcome. But their, their decisions at that point are highly um, independent. Later on, they cease to pay attention. Once that quorum is met, then you can make um, extensive changes well, for one thing, you can take all of the ants out, and the ants who are already recruiting there won't notice. They'll just keep recruiting. And they'll keep doing that. And they'll keep doing it. They, if you do that in the early phase, they notice, and they sort of become concerned, and they, and they either, either they, they may stop recruiting, they may continue to do tandem runs. But after that, it's as though they're blind to it. Even if you change the quality of the nest, it's very hard for a colony, once they've started transporting, we've done this experiment, we sort of inverse, invert the quality of the two nests. If you do that before they've started transporting, they're very good at redirecting their emigration to what is now the better site. But if you do it after the quorum is met, they're very poor. Um, we'd like actually to do that more experimentally. We, ha we have our own version of a, a less effective version of a, of a robot uh, than your fish, but we do have a little uh, it, a robotic ant. That we want to do that kind of experiment with the lead ants to the, the wrong choice, for example. Good morning, I'm Sheen Levine of Columbia University, and uh, I'm a social scientist, and I find that there's much to learn from your uh, worlds to inform mine. I'm interested in competition, and as I was, into, as I was listening to your talks, it uh, struck me that in all of the settings, whether it's Stevens' ants or Jens' fishes or Radica's robots, uh, there's a presumption that the other individual is cooperative or disinterested, right? One of the difficulties in our world is that other individuals, other human individuals, may be cooperative, may be disinterested, but they also may be competitors. And this could put a limit on people's tendencies to cooperate and create collective intelligence. So I wonder, in your settings, in our uh, research settings, do you see situations in which individuals may compete with each other and how this affect their behavior? Yes, I mean, we, we see it in the, uh, this experiment with the, the true stimulus for the, for the fish eating something. Um, I mean, we've just got started on this, on the system, but it should actually be in the interest of, of the fish to conceal when they found the true positive, uh, rather than make that obvious, because some of these objects are consumed very quickly, yeah. and it's not in your interest um, to bring others in unless it's for cohesion and safety, which comes back to the consensus issue that Naomi mentioned. Right. I mean, we're looking at the um, problem of evasion of a herd uh, when there's heterogeneity in the herd. For instance, when, say, it's a group of females that have each of them a young, precocious young that can run but can only run as fast as they are, you know, weeks old. So there may be very slow ones who have newborns and. Uh, faster ones who have, you know, few week old ones, and so you have a predator coming, and there is absolutely inter-species competition. So they don't all just split, right? There's the, you know, the old adage that I don't have to, you know, outrun the predator; I just have to outrun you, <laughs> right? So, 
so the, you know what we're learning in the, our collaborations with our with this is with Dan Rubenstein is that absolutely you know the animal will tend move towards the slower at least that they can sense and so there is this this interspecies competition and we're seeing that as we derive sort of mathematical formulas for what strategies they might use say you know, selfishly to, to minimize their own time, but they, they absolutely take into consideration what the others near them are going to be doing. So I think this does come up all over the place. Yeah. Uh, Paul Resnick, University of Michigan. It's a question for Radhika. I'm, I'm curious in these assembly uh, systems where you're compiling a program, are, are you generating the same program for all of the robots, or do they have differentiated programs? And is there some theorem about you can make a more complicated program that they all do versus having uh, different ones for all of them? It's a really great question, uh, especially because we've just started trying to work on that. Um, I think our first, you know, I think all of my work to this point, we're usually generating a homogeneous program. And perhaps because, you know, my first sources of inspiration were all cells and sort of the idea that they all had the same DNA. And so differentiation occurs as a result of situations you encounter rather than a priori compiling out a set where you have different populations. But I think in the construction setting, you really would want that because one of the things we can't do is we actually can't make these robots run for very long. It's really hard to make them reliable. It's also hard to make reliability go to zero. Some robot will get stuck, some block will be misplaced. Eventually, you want different kinds of robots. You want essentially the tow trucks, and you want different kinds of things. So that setting sort of says that we should move towards heterogeneity, where maybe recovery is one piece, and adding is one piece, and removing is one piece, and maybe we should think about that. Um, but we haven't thought well about that. And I think the other side that maybe might make this compelling is just like a robot can't mechanically do everything. Um, synthetic biology is another example where we're looking at this problem, where a cell, you can't program it to do everything. So perhaps just from a computational load, we have to split the program into pieces that do different things. And I think that's just starting to happen, thinking about synthesizing ecologies rather than synthesizing a single homogeneous population. Still really, I think, early stage. The last question. Hi, I'm Iftak Nagar from MIT, and my question is to Stephen Pratt. So, um, you showed uh, essentially a, a scenario of a binary selection. So we have a, the darker rectangle or, or square and the lighter. Um, and my question is, have you looked at situations where there is a, a, a decision to make among multiple and potentially many options? So if there are 10 nests to choose from, what happens? Um, individuals versus a collective decision and also you know, what are the limits? What happens if you have a hundred nests? Does, does decision-making collapse altogether? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I mean, obviously a binary choice is very simplified in nature. I mean, it's hard to specify, really, but there's a lot of holes in the ground, essentially, that they could potentially mm -hmm. move into. So they undoubtedly face a much more complex a, a set of options than we give them. We've done some things along those lines. Um, one thing we found, for example, is if you give um, a colony eight nests, and four of them are all equally, equal in design and good, and four of them are equal design and poor or mediocre. They're very good at just picking one of the good ones. So they don't split among them. They, they reach consensus on one of the good nests with very high probability, um, that really just about as well as they do when there's only two. Um, if you do the same thing for an individual ant, then an individual ant, again, is, is perfectly good at selecting between two nests when one is clearly better than the other. But if you give the individual that same choice of eight, they do extremely poorly. Essentially, it's random. Um, so the way we interpret that is that they're actually able to handle a large number of options because they're distributing the burden of assessment. If you look at follow individual ants in a colony, very few of them assess more than one or two sites. So at the level of individual cognition, they don't, they're not really overburdened by an assessment demand. If you take one ant, though, and require her to assess two or four or six or eight, then that seems to be more than she can handle, and she ends up just choosing randomly. Yeah. But we, we've only started to explore that kind of multiple, you know, large number of options case. Great. Well, let's, uh, I think we have a, a break now for 10 or 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll, uh, sorry, we, we got, we're a bit over time, so we'll have to stop. Um, 
and uh, and then we'll move to the the parallel sessions. Thank you. Uh, thank all the speakers again, please.